Welcome to AASF's uh, webinar tonight. Uh, my name is Wei Sun Shi, a professor of computer science from Wayne State University. I'm also the president of the Association of Chinese Scholars in Computing. It's also the hosting organization for tonight, tonight's event. Uh, next, I would like to introduce today's moderator, um, Dr. Ya Shen Huang from MIT. Dr. Huang is a professor from MIT Snow School of Management. And he's also the president of AASF, um, which is the organization for today's event. And uh, we, uh, he is a, have a very busy schedule and we are honored to have him join us as a moderator uh, tonight. Next, I will pass the podium to him to uh, introduce today's uh, keynote speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Wei Song, for the introduction. Welcome, everybody, to our regular webinar. Um, today's topic is on combating racial profiling. And uh, uh, the, today's uh, webinar is jointly organized and sponsored by Asian American Scholars Forum and Asian American Advancing Justice. The Association of Chinese Scholars in Computing is the hosting organization for this webinar. Before I introduce uh, Representative uh, Judy Chu, I'd like to mention uh, the participating organizations in today's webinar. They represent over 7,000 members in various universities and in all in many, many disciplines. Uh, Today in attendance are members of Asian American Scholars Forum. And we have Professor Jian Ming Guo, President of Chinese American Chemistry and Chemical Biology Professors Association. Professor Yi Guang Ju, Board of Directors, US Chinese Scholar Association of Combustion Institute. Professor Yi Bing Kang, President of Chinese Biological Investigator Society. Dr. Xiaowen Li, President of Chinese American Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. Professor Xi Hong Ling, President of Tsinghua Alumni Academic Club of North America. Professor Wei Song Shi, President of Association of Chinese Scholars in Computing. Haipei Xue, President United Chinese Americans. Professor Colin Wu, President of International Chinese Statistical Association. Professor Hui Zheng, President of Society of Chinese Bioscientists in America. Now I have the greatest honor to introduce Representative Judy Chu, our keynote speaker today. Representative Chu represents the 27th Congressional District of California, which includes Pasadena and the West San Gabriel Valley of Southern California. She is the first Chinese American woman elected to Congress in history. Quite an accomplishment, uh, incredible accomplishment. She is the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, which advocates for the needs and concerns of the Asian American and Pacific Islander community across the nation. She helps lead the Tri Caucus, a joint effort with the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. We're extremely honored and happy to have Representative Ju to give the keynote speech today. Representative, Representative Judy Chu. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and for today's important webinar on anti-Asian profiling and what we can do about it. I want to thank Asian Americans Advancing Justice for your leadership in hosting today's conversation. 
and all the groups that are here today for all you're doing to help the API community stand up to hate and prejudice. This webinar could not come at a more important time for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, there have been over 7,500 anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents, many fatal. But it was not until the horrific murders of six Asian women at three Asian-owned spas in Georgia that the country was shocked awake to the reality of anti-Asian violence. The horrendous surge of anti-Asian hate crimes finally resulted in a bipartisan show of support that led to the passage of the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act that will help us better track and respond to hate crimes. But we've, while we finally have an administration that's willing to get serious about hate crimes, our community is facing a growing threat of more violence and prejudice because of a renewed political focus on China. In fact, there's even an initiative called the China Initiative, which has led to greater racial profiling from our own government. The China Initiative, an effort to stop Chinese espionage in American scientific research, is unique among Department of Justice investigations. Whereas most investigations start with a crime and then find a suspect, this initiative starts with the suspect and then searches for a crime. Just family ties to China or even professionally encouraged research and collaboration can be enough to trigger an investigation. In fact, this initiative stands out as one of the only Department of Justice efforts named for a specific country. And so as a result, simply doing research while Chinese could be enough to have your life and career ruined by a criminal conviction. This is more commonly known as racial profiling. This has real consequences for the way these investigations play out with chilling effects for both the Chinese American community and our country as a whole. First, by looking specifically at Chinese scientists, we might be missing real instances of espionage from other countries. As a former CIA, CIA director, uh, Robert Gates said, there are probably a dozen or 15 countries that steal our technology, but only one country, China, has been deemed to require what FBI Director Christopher Wray called a whole of society response. This is the exact kind of language that leads to widespread mistrust of Chinese Americans. Second, this initiative prioritizes convictions, not justice. And that has too often meant bringing a case without sufficient grounds, something that has ruined the lives of people like Dr. An Ming Hu. Born in China, Dr. Hu attained a PhD in laser physics in Canada, where he also gained citizenship. In 2013, he was hired by the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where he applied for permanent US citizenship and was promoted thanks to his tireless and excellent work. But to the Department of Justice, the only part of his resume that mattered was his affiliation with China. And in February, 2020, Dr. Hu was arrested for espionage. This case was the first case under the China initiative to go to trial and the results are telling. It turns out that in a year and a half of undercover surveillance of Dr. Hu, the FBI uncovered no evidence of espionage. Instead, all they found was a paperwork error related to university approved summer work with a Chinese university. This was a recording mistake, not espionage. And during the trial, one of the FBI agents admitted that his PowerPoint presentation to the university that claimed that Dr. Hu had ties to the Chinese military was based on falsified information. The lack of any evidence and the testimony that the evidence they did have was false, resulting in a mistrial. But the damage was already done. On the weight of the FBI's false evidence, Dr. Hu lost his job and his reputation and blew through his savings to pay his legal fees. 
and the suspicion, isolation, and fear took a great emotional toll on him and his family. But there was another consequence as well. Dr. Who's wife wrote that after seeing his father arrested, their son, David, who was studying at the university where his father taught, immediately questioned his future in computer science and ultimately was forced to return to Canada. This is a consequence that I hear every day. Even Chinese American students who have no connections to these investigations are afraid to enter STEM fields, conduct research, or collaborate with Chinese partners out of fear their lives could be ruined next. This fear was made worse by a shocking revelation by a Senate report that came out last week. It found there was a rogue unit at the Department of Commerce that had been operating for a decade without any authority, opening up investigations on 2000 Department of Justice employees, mostly Asian Americans, based only on their ethnicity. Called the Investigations and Threat Management Service or ITMS, this unit took on law enforcement activities that treated these employees as national security threats without cause or notification. Not only were these investigations unjustified and flawed, they failed to uncover any national security threats despite the thousands of investigations that were opened and the numerous lives ruined. According to whistleblowers, constitution, constitutional protections for Asian Americans were regularly ignored in search of proof to justify improperly started investigations. And one of those persons that was the fallout from this unit was Sherry Chen, who is somebody we all know was arrested for espionage in the Department of Justice, lost her job, suffered so much only to have all charges dropped. We in KPEC are outraged and we've called for the disbanding of this unit. We met with Secretary Gina Raimondo yesterday, Secretary of Commerce. Thankfully, Raimondo was very responsive. She just inherited this position and had already taken action to stop their activities and has evaluated 1,000 of the 2,000 cases, which mostly did not have any justification. She said she will either disband this unit or substantially change it. Today's conversation on how we can fight back is so important because we need to make more Americans aware of this government-led racial profiling. That is what Congress member Jamie Raskin and I did just last month when we hosted a House Oversight Committee roundtable discussion for members of Congress to hear from experts, former FBI agents, and researchers who had their lives upended by these investigations. And in the coming days, I will be sending a letter to the Department of Justice Inspector General asking for more information about the alleged FBI misconduct in the Doctor Who investigation. And we will work to make sure this rogue counterintelligence unit in the Department of Commerce does not operate like this again. But we need to do more to protect others. That can start with halting the China Initiative. It was flawed from the start by focusing on ethnicity over the crime, which is why what happened to Dr. Who is not an exception. In fact, just this week, the Department of Justice announced they were dropping charges against five more Chinese scientists, again, without explanation, despite the harm already done. This shows that these investigations are rooted in racial profiling, not national security. Ties to China alone cannot be the basis for an investigation that can ruin a person's life. The Department of Justice should be pursuing facts, not race, and we should be encouraging scientific collaboration, not creating a fear of it. 
Second, we should stop the Cold War rhetoric. When the Chinese government acts against our interests or values, we can and must speak out. But we need to be deliberate in what and who we criticize. It should be those who are held responsible, not all Chinese people. And we can't let fear become an excuse to rob Chinese Americans of their civil liberties. There are still those alive today who were forced into US prison camps during World War II because it believed that just being Japanese made them untrustworthy and potential spies. This policy was wrong then, and a policy of mass suspicion is wrong today. That is why this month, I and our KPAC leadership sent guidance to every member of Congress on how to speak out against Chinese China's policies without stoking xenophobia here. That means not spreading unfounded suspicions that paint all Chinese people as threats and which put innocent Chinese Americans at risk. And it means not singling out China for actions that others are guilty of as well. Instead, I'm urging members on both sides to focus on policies and solutions, not just vague threats. So thank you again for taking part in today's webinar and to all of you for what you're doing to stand up for the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Thank you, Representative Chu. Uh, we thank you for your leadership, for your vision, and for your sense of humanity and sense of justice. I think we need a leader like you to lead the charge against these acts of injustice. Because Representative Chu has other engagements, she only has time for three previously prepared questions. So we're now going to open up to Q&A for this particular part of the webinar. I'm just going to ask Representative Chu three previously prepared questions. And one is, what are some of the ways for grassroots Asian American organizations to effectively communicate with government officials and our representatives? Well, first of all, let me say that communicating with your representatives is a very, very powerful thing. They need to hear, they need to hear your voice. Now we all know about the AAPI hate crimes. It started in the beginning of last year with COVID and then was stoked by President Trump's terms, the China virus and Wuhan virus and Kung flu. But it wasn't until people in the AAPI community reached out to others that communities organized events, marches and rallies across the nation, and it became impossible to ignore. And in fact, uh, all of this work made our National Virtual Day of Action such a success that we reached over a billion online interactions. And also it made it possible for us to pass the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, and I'll never forget standing behind President Biden in the White House as he signed that bill into law. Now, the issue of racial profiling of scientists and engineers and academicians is something that is more subtle. And I know that our officials don't know about it. And the reason I know about it is I told you just now about this round table, this uh, House Committee on Oversight's round table um, on racial profiling of Chinese American scientists and engineers. And so uh, thank thankfully it was um, hosted by the chair of that committee, Congress member Jamie Raskin. You know why he did it? Because he heard from you, because he heard from scientists and engineers in the National Institute of Health. And he became familiar with what was going on with the fear and anxiety that was going on. We then had this very powerful roundtable, And 
you know what? What I'll never forget is afterwards running into one of the members of Congress on that committee, Congress member Eleanor Holmes Norton, who represents Washington, D.C. And you know what she said to me? I didn't have a single clue that this was going on. I could not believe it. She could not hear, believe the stories of the injustices that had occurred to so many Chinese scientists and engineers. And of course, Eleanor Holmes Norton is somebody who stands up for justice. So she would have been inclined to support such a thing in the first place, but she did not know. I actually encounter this many times over. I'm constantly educating my colleagues in Congress as to the racial profiling of Chinese scientists and engineers, but I really and truly need your help because so many of you are in districts where you have a representative that could truly help. Like I'll never forget, uh, Jake Ossenkloss, Congress member of Massachusetts came to me and told me what he heard from his constituents because he represents MIT and other um, Ivy League institutions. And he said, I could not believe what I heard. It is your stories that will convince Congress members that something needs to be done about this and that we have to stand up for this and that we should not have things like this rogue unit that was investigating 2000 employees of the Department of Justice. This has to stop. And it is with your education of these Congress members, elected leaders, and the community that this can stop. Thank you, Representative Chu. This is very important uh, uh, piece of information, which is that never assume an issue, even though it is utterly important to our community, never assume that the knowledge is actually there. Um, so we need to speak up, right? So the agency is on our part, as well as on the part of uh, people in the government. Um, I think the second related question is, how do we hold attorney generals accountable for instigating these investigations as, as you pointed out before, starting with suspects rather than starting with crime, uh -huh. how do we hold them accountable? Yeah, so it is important to recognize that these are federal investigations and not local ones. So it's not your district attorneys of your local areas. It's not the attorney generals of the state, uh, but it would be the FBI. It would be the department of justice. And that's what is um, initiating these investigations. Um, where you see prosecutors deciding to drop charges, as in the case of those five Chinese scientists that I just talked about, it's clear they had to drop because they didn't have a case to bring before a judge. And I do think the fact that we are raising their voices and saying that we are watching and that we are going to raise our voices if they're doing things like what they did to Dr. Anming Hu, where they actually lied about him having ties to the uh, military of China then that makes them think twice. So that's why whenever we see an injustice like that, we have to be as loud as possible. We have to make sure that they know that there will be accountability. And we have to make sure that there are clearer rules and oversight to ensure that the investigations are being done in accordance with the constitution and law enforcement best practices. And when we have somebody who will listen to us, like thankfully, uh, Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo did listen to us. Um, 
then we have to make sure that we push as much as possible that such uh, renegade and rogue units are disbanded because we are looking and we are holding our federal government responsible. Thank you, Representative Chu. Let me ask the final uh, question. So we all recognize the complications between US and, and, and China. So the question here is how can policymakers address national security concerns while upholding open basic research by universities and by academics? In the Reagan administration, there was a document, the National Security Decision Directive 189, which is still in force, has asserted that academic basic research should be unrestricted and address national security concerns through classification. Do we need a new thinking about this model and how do we resolve this particular problem? So let us recognize that there are legitimate national security concerns. And if we don't recognize it, then we lose our credibility, frankly. Um, we have to recognize that um, we need to protect the, um, the kinds of things that uh, are very valuable to America's national security, that is important to the uh, kinds of things that uh, are our intellectual property. These are very, very important things. And of course, remember that we need to make sure that we have the whole of America on our side. And it means that we also have to listen to their concerns, which is that we are a strong America who can maintain its place in the world. But at the same time, I think that we always have to raise um, some important points, which is that for one thing, China is a national security concern, but how about Russia and Iran? And in fact, I wanna tell you about a dust up that occurred in the Appropriations Committee um, recently, uh, we had a hearing and a, a, a Republican Congress member put in an amendment saying that um, all Chinese nationals should not be allowed to buy U.S. farmland. Well, Congress member Grace Meng is on that committee and she protested because what do you mean all Chinese nationals. You mean, that's kind of, that's a lot of people because, you know, there are many Chinese here with, with green cards and so forth. It's like the alien land laws in the 1920s where no Asians could buy land. Um, so because of her protests and others who spoke up and we spoke up to, um, it was changed so that it would be uh, the Chinese Communist Party and government uh, the government of China, basically, that could not purchase U.S. farmland. But we actually were protesting, saying that, why is it that you're putting this as a prohibition against China, but not against Russia or Iran? Is it okay for Vladimir Putin and the Ayatollah Khomeini to buy precious U.S. farmland? Of course not. But they didn't recognize it and they didn't change it. Uh, we actually still want to change it, of course, uh, but at least because of our protest, we changed it uh, to be somewhat better. Um, we need to insist that uh, any kind of uh, investigation be fair, be just, and that it is based on better evidence than just race. And we need to emphasize that China is not the only security concern. There are other countries that are 
of concern. And we have to say these things over and over. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Chu, for this inspirational speech and very good and sound advice. The main takeaway that I have is that we have the responsibility to act in our own ways, and we need to speak up. Thank you. On behalf of AASF, on behalf of AAJC, thank you so much for uh, um, giving the keynote speech to our webinar tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, I like to transition to our next segment, which is um, the presentation and speech by uh, uh, our special uh, panelist, John Yang. And AASF has been working very closely with AAJC. And Zhuang Yang is the president and executive director of Asian American Advancing Justice, AAJC in Washington, DC, where he leads the organization's mission to advance the civil and human rights of Asian Americans and to build and promote a fair, equitable society for all through policy advocacy, education, litigation. He has served in leadership positions for the American Bar Association, the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, and the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, among many other uh, positions and responsibilities. Prior to advancing justice, AAJC, Zhuang has served as the political appointee in the Obama administration, addressing US trade and economics, the Asia Pacific legal director based in Shanghai, China of a Fortune 200 company and as a partner at a large DC based law firm. He also serves on the diversity council for several Fortune 500 US companies and John is fluent in Mandarin Chinese. The floor is yours, John. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Yashan. And I, great thanks to Representative Chu. I think she has already left for her remarks and her leadership. Uh, her, her leadership, I should emphasize to everyone watching this, has been really incredible. And we should all applaud the work that she's been doing and really raising the visibility of this particular issue. Because obviously this is an issue that all of you know, all of you are living, all of you are experiencing. But as she said, unfortunately too many in what we would call the mainstream audience uh, even people that care about civil rights don't really know this. And so we need leaders like her to raise this literally at the highest levels to, to President Biden. You know, she demanded a meeting with Ambassador Susan Rice, who was in charge of the Domestic Policy Council, to talk specifically about this issue and what can be done. Uh, so as Yasha said, you know, I am the executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. So we're a civil rights organization whose mission is to advance the civil and human rights of Asian Americans and to promote a fair and equitable society for all. So what does that mean? Uh, that means we work on issues affecting our community, our Asian American community. You know, we work on it through a couple of different lens. First is through what we would call public policy. That is working with the Hill, working with the administration to think about how these policies are affecting our community and what we can do to make those policies better. Second is through community engagement. So this is talking to all of you, talking to our communities nationwide about the issues that matter to us, making sure that we sitting in DC understand those issues so that we could properly represent all of you in the halls of Congress at the White House uh, and the like. Third is we litigate. So we will file lawsuits. We don't directly represent individuals, uh, but what we do is we file what are called impact cases. So as you may remember, Back in 2018, uh, then President Trump had sought to put a citizenship question on the United States decennial census, census 2020. We knew that putting that type of a question would create fear in our Asian American community and cause our community not to respond to the census and therefore have an inaccurate count of Asian Americans here in the United States. So we filed a lawsuit. Similarly, we are part of a lawsuit with our independent Atlanta affiliate on voting rights to make sure that Asian Americans have the right to vote, have access to the ballot box like any other American. 
And, and last, we work with the media, really making sure that the stories of Asian Americans are told, are told in the proper light. So why are we so interested in this issue? On one level, it's obvious, right? Because you know, we work on all of these types of civil rights issues. This is just another segment of that. And as Representative Chu has talked about, as Professor Huang has talked about, you know, this is certainly affecting our community. But we also think about it through the lens of history. Because on one hand, this China initiative that we're all fighting right now is sort of front and center in all of our minds. And, and that's sort of the direct objective that we have is to put what we would call a moratorium, put a stop on the China initiative, put a stop on this racial profiling. But the reality is, if you go back through the history, this has been with us for a while. Whether we talk about the case of Sherry Chen, whether we talk about the case of Xiao Xing Xi, but then you go backwards in time to thinking about what happened to Wen Ho Li in the late 1990s. This is all part of that same segment that unfortunately we've seen too often. And it's just not, although those cases involve the Chinese American community, what I would urge all of you to think about is how this also impacts all of our different communities. And when I say that, I'm thinking about 9-11 and what happened to the Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, South Asian American community who got targeted thinking that all of them were somehow terrorists or should be suspects for terrorism, right? And then as Representative Chu talked about back in World War II, when all Americans, you notice I say Americans, of Japanese descent were treated as potential traitors, potential spies for the empire of Japan, and they were put in concentration camps, internment camps here in the United States, even though they were citizens. So that's part of the perspective that we look at these issues is how it's impacted all of us. The other perspective we should remember is when we're talking about racial profiling, you know, how all of us should stand in solidarity with each other. And here I'm thinking about the African-American community. You know, we've probably heard the stories of driving while black, right? And, and recognizing that that community faces profiling of its own. And so how we work together with all of these communities to dismantle that sort of profiling. So with respect to this particular project specifically, this anti-racial profiling project, you know, we think about it in, if you will, three pillars. One is education, two is, uh, is advocacy, and, and three is representation. So first, with respect to education, it's just making sure that people are aware of the issue, making sure people are aware of, for all of you, that you guys know what your rights are. The fact that when FBI knocks on your door, you don't have to answer the door. You do not have to answer questions from the FBI without an attorney present. You know, making sure you know your basic rights, the fact that you should get an attorney to help represent you, and that that does not suggest that you are guilty of anything. So making sure that you guys are aware of what your rights are, but that education also should be extended to the university officials. Make sure that they know what they're doing, right? and not just sort of really throwing you all under the bus, so to speak, you know, allowing you to take the responsibility for what is happening. And then obviously educating the general public about what is happening, right? Number two is what we would call advocacy. And Representative Chu talked at length about sort of the types of advocacy that is helpful. It is really sort of whether it's going to DOJ, whether it's going to the Biden administration, going to Congress, and letting people know about these issues and what can be done about these issues. And so where you all can play a role is certainly whether it is calling members of Congress, like Representative Chu suggested, organizing rallies that get noticed by a presidential administration and the like, like what we saw in Tennessee for Dr. Who. Uh, whether it is writing, writing letters and sending in petitions, like we've tried to help organize around some of these different initiatives. All of these little things really do help to make a difference. I don't think, I, I think we should be proud of the fact that DOJ dropped these five cases in, the, in, in this last weekend or so. And this is a direct result of advocacy that all of us have had. You know, the fact that sort of, you know, there are different elements that are coming out talking openly about how this seems to have been an abuse of process. And, and let me make clear, you know, when we're talking about all of these things, we do recognize, as Re Representative Chu said, we do certainly recognize that there is still absolutely a national security threat that we should be all aware of. No question about that. But that national security threat cannot be conflated with some of the things that we are actually seeing in your communities. You know, 
Are there mistakes sometimes being made in grant applications? Are there cases in which someone has engaged in some type of fraud because they are what we would call double dipping, getting grant monies for from a Chinese university as well as an American university? Yeah. And in those cases, I think all of you would agree with me that those cases should be addressed. But here's where all of us should be talking about this is that, you know, we could talk about accountability for those types of mistakes, for those types of even, uh, uh, you know, faults that have, been, that have been made. But we should talk about accountability without over-criminalization. This notion that DOJ is trying to catch spies, but they end up sort of really resorting to these paperwork uh, omissions as what they actually charge people for. It's just overblown. It's what we would call over-criminalizing the issue, right? We do want people to do the right thing when it comes to grant application, full disclosures and consistent with university policies or NIH or NSF policies. But that's different. When people make a mistake, we should allow them to fix that mistake and not charge them for what we call a felony, you know, have them serve jail time, have them under house arrest so that they have no access to their bank accounts or the like because of some of these things. So that's what advocacy looks like, is having all of us speak up to, to all of these things. Uh, and then number three is representation. So one of the things that we really discovered during this period of time is that number one, you know, people are not aware of their rights. But the number two is once you're aware of your rights, we really need all of you. So if you are being contacted by FBI or DOJ to get a lawyer, know what your legal rights are and don't be very, very careful in how you engage, right? And when I say get a lawyer, one of the things we recognized was that here in this area, right, it's a very specialized area of law. And so just going to a, will, uh, a real estate attorney, a trust and estates attorney, or even you know, a general criminal attorney that handles driving under the influence or sort of petty, what we would call petty misdemeanors, that's probably not going to do the trick, right? Because these are sophisticated attorneys on the federal government side that are trying to address what they would consider pretty sophisticated crimes. And so one of the things we wanna make sure that all of you do is that if you encounter situations like this, you get the legal representation that, that you need. And here, one of the things that I want to make sure people know is we have essentially a hotline. It's, it's using the Signal app so that if you have a question, if you need to find a lawyer, you should contact this number. And the number is 202-935-6014. And that's being put in the chat line. And so if you need a lawyer, if you need to understand your rights, contact us. Uh, Vivian Chang, who is going to be a part of our panel later, uh, is the person that typically would respond to these messages. She speaks Mandarin Chinese as well, so that, that that way we could really, you know, engage in a thoughtful way with all of you. So that's what we're trying to do with all of this. Obviously, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm so happy to be speaking with all of you because you guys are the ones that are being impacted. We're just here to help tell your stories. I think the last thing that I would leave you with is this, and then obviously we'll engage in a conversation, is... When I say tell your story, that is super important. That is very critical. Uh, as Representative Chu said, you know, your ability to tell what your stories are, humanize these experiences, really does move people. When we've talked with administration officials, I'll be honest, there's only so far an organization like mine can go, right? Uh, because they, can, they kind of know that's part of our job. But when they see your faces, when they hear your stories, it's not possible to dismiss in the same way. You know, and in that sense, I am fortunate in some ways, right? In the sense that I am Chinese American. I spent time in China. Uh, actually, it's interesting because uh, as uh, Yashin said, I spent time at the Department of Commerce. And it's interesting because I actually had interactions with this, uh, this section, this intelligent threat management section that, that that's under scrutiny right now. And Certainly, I wonder about some of those interactions. I, I wonder about sort of whether I was under scrutiny because sometimes I would uh, I would be emailing friends in Chinese or you know, talking to people you know that are based in China because that's where some of my business contacts still were. So you know we do live in a time that is interesting. We do live in a time where we need to be mindful of all of these things. 
But I am I am actually very hopeful. I do think that this administration uh, is turning a new page. They are much more sensitive to some of these issues that, that we have, but there are still challenges that remain. And, and again, that is where we need all of you to speak up. We're happy to work with you uh, to help tell your stories, to sort of think about what that story is. If you want to talk to a member of Congress from your district, we can help arrange that meeting. You know, there's so many things that we can do to really help find those links. And I think that's the final thing I would say is that's why organizations like ASF, UCA, any of these other organizations are great because it helps to organize all of us, give us a unified voice, give us a, a, a specific and sometimes simple message because that's what members of Congress, that's why what sometimes administrations uh, need is that direct simple message of what needs to be done. So let me stop there. I look forward to engaging in conversation with all of you. Thank you, John. Uh, it's, it's every time uh, I listen to you, uh, I learn uh, new things. And uh, so the, the impacted persons that we read in the newspaper, uh, in the media, are probably the tip of iceberg, right? And I, I think increasingly uh, universities, um, some, some acts of injustice may very well start at the employer level and uh, at the university level. Um, and those are the cases that probably just quietly went away. So they never made it into the pages of uh, newspapers. So we don't really know what happened. What, what is your advice and strategy of taking on those cases? And, and it's especially hard because we don't know that it has happened except through hearsay um, and, and it's, it's usually, it's not publicized and, and universities don't talk about them. The impacted persons usually chose just to leave, um, but, but nevertheless, it is an act of injustice committed against some of these people without the due process. And we should, we should be concerned about those situations and cases as well? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, a couple of things, a couple of thoughts. One is, and not to put the burden on uh, the Scholars Forum or other groups like yours, but I, I wonder whether your group could serve as a forum, right? So that people could share those stories. They could share them even anonymously if they want. But those stories collectively will make up a body of work that, that is worthwhile. And you're right, if we're being candid about it, many of those stories, there's not much that we could do about it, right? Because maybe it's already happened, it's in the past, it's too late to do something, or, or the person, the impacted individual, just doesn't want to pursue it. And that's okay. But at least if we could collect that story, then we could take that and again, bring it to Congress, bring it to uh, members of the administration say, here are some of the stories that we have. Here are some of the incidents that we have. And look at all of the different varieties in which Asian American academics, scientists have been discriminated against. You know, this is something that requires, just as FBI Director Ray says that it's a whole of society problem with respect to Chinese espionage, which we disagree with, you know, it, it should be a whole of society problem as to how we address this racial profiling. Because I think you're right. Many universities, they take what they think is the easy way out, right? So that once they hear of issues, they, they want to either terminate the professor or kind of find some way to ease them out. Um, does that rise to a level of an employment issue? Maybe. But again, you know, it, it may be that, that that individual professor will not want to pursue it. What I analogize this to is with respect to anti-Asian hate. So, you know, for anti-Asian hate, our organization, we're not the only ones, our organization has a website called standagainsthatred.org, where if you are a victim of anti-Asian hate, you can report that on the website. Now, on the website, if you want somebody to respond and get, you know, some help, we certainly can do that. But many times people just want to tell their stories because it makes them feel a little bit better. And then we're able to collect those stories. And part of why the hate crimes bill was passed was because when we testified before Congress, we were able to give those stories, give direct examples 
how Asian Americans were being affected. And so it's the same here, thing here is if we could get that collection of stories, that will help in this process. Thank you. This is a very good piece of advice. And I will urge the leaders of various organizations that are in audience today to try to collect these stories. And AASF and AAJC, uh, you know, AASF at least, uh, but I think John is also willing to collect these uh, stories. And uh, it will be good that we start this kind of information gathering uh, uh, as soon as possible. Let me open up the uh, discussion to first to the panelists and then to the to the audience. Uh, let me see. So, uh, okay, uh, Yi Guang, Yi Guang. Hi, hi, John, and uh, you are really that our hero and the leader of civil rights. I'm very pleased uh, to listen in person about your your speech. Uh, one of the things that I want to share is that uh, it is very clear now that the DOJ is really relentlessly, repeatedly, purposely, and forcefully charged many Asian American scientists. I don't want to give you the name, there's so many right now have been dismissed already. The question is really that how to stop the DOJ's China initiative for this discriminative and racial profiling practice. I listened to uh, Representative Judy Chu said that uh, there are three things to do. And you also said uh, there are three things to do. One is that speak aloud, which we are doing and we, with your support and help. And the second thing that is litigation and accountability, right? And, uh, and the third is oversight. So litigation is a legal action and uh, of this wrongdoing. And the oversight should be from Congress and from the president. I think that we are doing, and a lot of people are doing the first, but we don't know how to do the second and the third. And actually that uh, the Red Scare and the 1950s ended because the oversight, the president instructed and, and stopped that the, the, the Red, Red Scare. So I, I think that what we can, could do in the number two and number three, and with your advice and the leadership, we really appreciate that for our society. Thank you. No, thank you for that. I think with respect to number two and number three, let's focus on number three first, the oversight piece. I think Congress has stepped it up. KPAC, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, has really done a good job. Uh, and I am cautiously hopeful that DOJ is going to rethink what they're doing. I, you know, we have an audience of about 500, so I don't want to say too much because I, I, I don't want to be on record as predicting something that ends up being completely wrong. But at the same time, uh, what we are hearing from the administration, what we are hearing from members of Congress, gives me some hope that this administration is trying to rethink this. How far they're going to be willing to go, whether they are going to actually stop the China initiative, I don't know yet, um, but I am hopeful that this continued pressure by everyone really has helped. Uh, on the litigation front, so this one's a little bit trickier, right? Because sort of it was harder to have an, what we would call an affirmative case against DOJ or against the federal government for prosecuting Chinese American scientists or academics. Um, Here's where I think, you know, you really want to go, go to a true legal expert uh, that, that, that really can think through these issues. Certainly, if the government falsely prosecutes you, maybe there are some remedies there. The other remedy to think about would be, what is your university doing to protect you, right? Uh, because in certain places, they may have an obligation to protect you from, from certain actions. If they are terminating you without cause, is that consistent with you know, the employment terms that, that you have? Again, this is a place that you would need to you know, uh, refer to an employment attorney, and especially an attor employment attorney that is familiar with the university process because the university process in itself, I know is pretty unique, but that's another play way to get accountability at least within the university system so that they are not simply defaulting to, okay, we don't want trouble 
if DOJ is coming to knock on our doors, the easy way for us to do it is cut off our ties with that individual professor. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Yeah. George? George Lowe. Uh, thank you, John, and uh, it's very informative and, and uh, I appreciate and all the advice. You know, I personally actually experienced uh, like uh, inquiry from uh, Ministry uh, uh, Education Department. Actually, uh, I gave her a seminar in, in back in uh, 2015 and at Wuhan Institute of Virology, and I even forgot about it until they inquire. And uh, so actually, uh, luckily, uh, I had uh, uh, all the approvals through university. Actually, we have an Oracle system. So I disclosed and got the university, you know, dean and, and, and uh, also associate dean for research and approved my trip. So actually, I even didn't know, but our manager actually dig out that print out and then ask me for this, you know, presentation slides, what I provided. So this kind of sense, that's what, you know, my, my daughter is also a lawyer, like you say, say, if anybody approach you, say it's the best thing, it's uh, just, you know, you say you don't want to answer any question, that's actually the trap. You know, if you think answer correctly and, and it will be like uh, another crime. So I think you're absolutely right. And, uh, but uh, you know, this kind of things, uh, you know, from what we can do, like you say, we should disclose, you know, as much as we, uh, we know that's the best thing, you know, uh, thing we can do to avoid this kind of trouble. Another thing, if like this kind of thing comes, uh, you know, from the top and, and then uh, how are we going to handle, you know, university clearly, I mean, is doing its share and to get information and, and uh, but a lot of times, like you say, it's, it's because we did not know, you know, you know, I, I'm a careful person. That's why I disclose everything. Even if I go to China for one or two days, I will get approval. But many people, maybe they don't know the policy. That's one, one thing I think education is very important. So, so I, I think from the national wide, and you know, I'm in the Alabama state, you know, it's, I don't know even the, the Republican Congress, you know, man or woman cares. So that's another frustration, you know, and what we can do. The only thing, you know, for me, it's like just, you know, and, and contributing, you know, financially to, to, to electing official, you know, and so hopefully they can speak for us. And yeah. so what do you advise to, you know, like me or many others in the red states, you know, we, really feel frustrated, you know, how much we can do to help or, or to vo voice, you know, raise our voice? Well, I, there's a couple of things. I mean, number one is even in the red states, right, a lot of the university towns are at least purple. So think about who your local elected officials are, even if they're not members of Congress, just to start raising these issues. Because even at that level, right, maybe they have contacts with the university itself to educate the university in a different way. So that, that's one way to start that process, right? Uh, because it, you're right. I mean, it can be frustrating, but I, I wouldn't give up on that process. And I would at, at a minimum, I mean, and we can sort of think through sort of uh, sort of who that member of Congress is that it, sort of that, that you are a constituent for. Um, whether there is a tie there. Because it's interesting because on issues like this, on one level, even some Democrats are frustrating because they politically, it seems like it's the easy thing to do to blame, the chi uh, blame China writ large. And, and what they mean is the Chinese government. And so even for Democrats, sometimes we need to educate them on that. But sometimes you will find unlikely Republican allies. Um, because you know of, of varying things, you know, like Senator Romney, for example. Although I wouldn't say he's good on this issue, you know, the fact that he is a Mormon, the fact that he is sort of has served on missions, actually means he is less anti-immigrant than some Republicans are. I, I'm just being very direct and candid about sort of the way I look at him, and so he can be an ally on certain issues that that you wouldn't necessarily expect. 
So I wouldn't sort of just write off all Republicans. Uh, and again, you know, we're a nonprofit, a nonprofit, nonpartisan group. So I, I don't think about it in terms of Republican and Democrats. Um, but then also let's think about your local officials, right? The last thing that I would say, and, and I appreciate Gazella for, for raising this, um, is that make sure sort of when I talk about having an attorney, make sure that that's your war attorney, because there are sometimes the university, right, will have the university attorney, or the university will even hire outside counsel. Those attorneys are really looking out for the university's interest. They are not really looking out for your interest. And, and even though so they may be friendly to you, even though that you may even know them if it's the, the university's own legal counsel, please be careful about that, right? And, and this is where certainly Gazelle and, and, and Vivian sort of that, that are on the AJC staff, they're great about this. They're, they're really the brains behind this. I, I just sort of talk about these issues, but you know, if you wanna get into depth on some of these issues, please reach out to, to, to them and we can obviously help guide the path. Thank you. Chigong, I'll go to you next, but I'd like to ask just a follow-up question uh, to John. Uh, John, you talk about Republicans. Um, are there talking points that are different that we should pay attention to when we talk to Democrats vis-a-vis -vis Republicans, or you don't think that there is a big difference? A, a couple of things. I mean, number one is, and you notice that Representative Chu said this, right? I think all of us, whenever we talk to, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, but perhaps especially conservatives, uh, people that are perceived to be China hawks, we should acknowledge that the Chinese government poses a challenge to the United States, right? And we could talk about it, not just with respect to espionage, but really with respect to human rights and democracy. You know, if you think about what the Chinese government is doing with respect to democracy in Hong Kong, the, the uh, Uyghur minority in Xinjiang. You know, so we could talk about it in terms of the Chinese government posing a threat and then talk about, but that doesn't justify some of these things that we're talking about. So if you frame it that way, that will help, right? Because if you start off by saying Chinese Americans are being racially profiled, some of them are just gonna turn off their, their uh, you know, it, or tune you out, you know, they're going to turn off their ears, so to speak, right? Uh, because they're just like, oh, you're being naive. There's a true national security challenge that we have here. This is an existential threat and you don't understand it, right? What you're trying to say is, yeah, we understand it, but this is not the way to do it. The other thing that both for Democrats and perhaps even for Republicans as well, we're not talking enough about is the benefit that all of you bring to American society, right? Uh, and then there again, telling your personal stories. You know, a lot of the conservatives, they're anti-communist, right? Uh, again, without speaking for everyone in the audience, my guess is that many of you came here to the United States because you believe in the academic freedoms, because you believe in sort of the, a way that American society gives more liberty, allows you more liberty to do what you want, do the research that you want, provide the life that you want here. That, that's why you decided to come here, right? If you talk about that, right, whether it's to conservatives or uh, progressives, I think you will get a different audience because then they're thinking, oh yeah, wait, national security should not only about be about keeping bad guys out, but also about how you keep good people, all of you that are contributing to American society, keep them in. There's not enough discussion about all what you guys are contributing here and how much you're doing to strengthen this country. So those are some additional talking points that I would offer that I don't think we've done a good job. When I say we, even at AAJC, we don't talk enough about that aspect, right? We, we tend to be defensive about how what you're doing to this community is bad, but we're not talking enough about that collateral damage on the United States itself because many of you you know, or your friends, right? I, I know this from personal experience. I have friends that have decided to go to Australia or go to Canada instead of coming to the United States because of some of these concerns, right? We need to talk more about that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Zhigang. Hey, John. It's really good to see you again. <laughs> you guys are doing great, uh, doing great work. Now, I want to return to a topic touched upon earlier. 
it's a university, the role of the university in all these things. And just try to get your thoughts on this. So from M. Ming Hu's case, just one specific case, but the point is very general that uh, M. Ming Hu, the injustice uh, against him come from two powerful institutions, the government and the university. And they openly declare they are in collaboration. There is a publisher everywhere. University is in collaboration with the government, two powerful institutions. In this particular case, on the day DOJ charges uh, I mean who, the university suspended his job, tenured position, this tenured position with zero due process. You cannot do due process in few few hours. So tenure, you probably know, know, tenure is something people earn, really hard to earn. And it's uh, commonly understood. Tenure can be only removed under, under extraordinary circumstances, such as uh, a department is terminated because uh, university ran out of money, or you have a proven guilty of some crime. Just being charged is not proven guilty. So now the general point is the following, I think is the following. So here's a university, very powerful, very resourceful, powerful lawyer. And, uh, and uh, here's the individual who is totally ignorant about legal system. And now your salary is cut. You don't have money to support yourself. Now, how do people handle this or against university? AJC has been upfront with, uh, with the government, essentially. Now there's another potential rogue actor, the university, potentially. And we have heard too many cases. What can we do? Yeah, so I wanna be careful not to give legal advice, so to speak, but um, one thing that people in that situation can do is find an employment lawyer. And many employment lawyers and this would be considered what's called the plaintiff side employment lawyer, because they would be suing the university. Depending on the type of case, you may find uh, very good employment lawyers that are plaintiff side that are willing to take this case uh, and take it for what's called the contingency fee. You know, in other words, if they win the case, they will recover a portion of the money that you get. If they don't win the case, they don't get anything. Or they might do some modification where you would only pay a smaller amount, but then you know, if, if you win the case, then the attorneys would get paid more fully. So definitely there are situations like that. And I think that's what you would look at, you know, in, in terms of how you get justice or how you get redress from the university. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, th thank you, John, for the <laughs> inspiration speech and uh, uh, thanks uh, Representative Chu um, for a very powerful keynote. Um, both of you have mentioned quite a bit about the power of individual stories of impacted persons or and such. And uh, uh, um, I feel like uh, probably we need uh, to mobilize uh, uh, Chinese American scholars to to find people who like to speak up, um, and uh, uh, some of the people who are who have been impacted by the the chilling effect of the China Initiative are graduating PhDs or postdocs also because they're uh, they may be changing their career preferences uh, and so on, and. Uh, uh, you know, today we have uh, many organizations uh, participating in the uh, in this webinar and representing over seven thousand, you know, uh, Chinese uh, American uh, scholars. Um, uh, do you have any advice how to mobilize people to find individual stories or find people who like to speak up? And uh, uh, um, I think that may be very helpful. Yeah. I think this is where all of your relationships are important, right? Because, you know, look, it takes courage to speak up and it takes courage to put yourself out there. And I don't blame people for not wanting to do it. 
Uh, and this is where you all as friends, as colleagues, when you hear one of these stories, you know, you, you ask them, well, would you be willing to tell this? Where would you be willing to tell it to? And, and frankly, it's going to take time. Like when we get stories, right? Like when you see us testifying in Congress and we tell a story about an individual, usually it took us several months, if not ye a year or two, to get to a point where it's comfortable for that person to tell their story. Uh, so it does take time. The other thing that is very, very important, though, is that we would never put someone out there without training, right? Before we ever put you in a situation that we would want you to talk to the media, want you to sort of testify in Congress, uh, we will help provide that training for you. I mean, you know, like even for me, I, I do media training, right? I, it's not as if I just go do this. It's I, I do training so that I'm ready for tough questions. I'm ready to figure out how to make sure that I get my points across in a succinct manner. And, and so that's the other thing you should absolutely tell people that have even a marginal interest. It's like, all right, if you're interested, you know, you get your toes wet, just talk to some people. And it's not as if you, you lose control, right? Even if you go through that training and then you say, well, I can't really do this. That's okay. That's okay. And we're not going to judge you for it because again, it takes great courage to do it. Uh, obviously, we want people to do it, but it's not for everyone, right? I mean, there are different pe different roles that people can play. That's just one role. And if, if there are people that are willing to do that, we want to encourage them and, and we want to be there to help them. And Ming, I'll get to you, uh, but let me ask a follow-up question on, on this. Are there potential legal consequences for a person who speaks up? Yeah, great question. That's something to be careful of, right? Is that if you have, and this is part of sort of what we do when we talk to people before they speak to the media, right? And again, this is why talking to people is important, uh, is if there is a pending DOJ investigation, if you know that the FBI has already been talking to you, you know, if you are, certainly if there's already a criminal indictment or some, some you know, uh, your complaint has been filed, then most likely we will not want you to go public, right? Because there's a lot of legal danger there. Then you have to work with your own attorney to figure out what might make sense there, right? Um, and so there are some situations where we would say, no, don't do it. Um, and again, that, that's definitely where there's a whole process that we have. I mean, I think that's, that's what I want to emphasize to people is, you know, if you have any interest at all, you know, let us know, you know, let's talk it through and we could go through those steps as to whether it makes sense, what are the risks that you have to think about, what are the benefits that you have to think about. And ultimately, again, ultimately, it's your decision. It's your decision. There's no judgment to that decision. Uh, but we want to just make sure that you feel good about what you're doing. Thank you, John. Uh, Ming? Thank you very much, John, uh, for uh, really inspiring and informative uh, uh, presentations and advice. Uh, um, so in the uh, earlier um, um, uh, AASF uh, webinar, uh, where experienced uh, defense attorneys that provided insights, uh, uh, um, for example, federal investigators seems to have uh, very few legal or ethical constraints to, uh, to lie or otherwise twist the facts. Uh, when targeting um, potential persons of interest in their investigation. This really um, is one of the most uh, eye-opening yet really concerning uh, things that I learned from um, some of these webinars. Um, and, the, and particularly there is, seems to be very few proper check and balance uh, holding them accountable uh, when their unethical discriminatory actions have really ruined the lives uh, such as uh, uh, Sherry Shen, um, Xiao Xingxi, and, uh, and I mean who, and more. So um, this uh, doesn't really sound right for a society that adv advocating the justice uh, and also for a country that holding pride for human rights. Uh, and really, I feel it's really the simply the, the basic uh, human decency. Um, so any comments from your experience and your knowledge um, what kind of actions that we could address such a fundamental yet really tricky uh, issues um, other than just uh, have a sigh and passively say we are having to 
live with uh, such unfortunate reality. Yeah, that's a hard one. And, and you know, I am going to say something that that you know maybe is a little bit contrary to what you might expect, which is I actually do think that many investigators are still ethical, that they you know they do play by the rules, so to speak. Um, are there bad apples? Absolutely. Uh, you know, at least for an attorney, you know, we get into, if we act in an unethical manner, uh, we could get disbarred. You know, we, we could lose our law license. And so the attorneys do have that in mind. Now, that said, I mean, do attorneys or FBI agents sort of, I, I, they would typically never lie outright but they will have misleading statements, right? They will pretend to be your friend so that you give them more information. They will use those types of tactics. One of the things I do think is important is, number one is obviously get an attorney before you talk to these people, right? Because that, that is important because that attorney will help protect you. The other aspect of all of this is try to keep good notes because if they are saying something that it turns out to be a lie later, if we have evidence of that, that will be helpful. I mean, that's what you saw in part in the Doctor Who case, right? With respect to this particular FBI agent, you know, that, that agent was caught in a lie. And I don't know enough about the case as to how it was determined so that the defense attorney was able to bring it up so sharply during the trial. But clearly there was enough there that he was able to point that out and get that on record in such a crisp way. So I think those are the, the, the things. The bigger picture quest problem though, right, is, and this is the other way I kind of think about it, is for many of these attorneys and FBI agents, it's their job. And so part of the problem is because the Trump administration, and even before that, there are, t there are places where they felt like they were under pressure to bring these types of investigations, under pressure to bring these types of cases, right? That's what caused them to engage in the conduct that they did. And so, you know, like if, if you are told, well, you know, your promotion depends on bringing X number of cases, they're going to try to bring X number of cases. And so in that sense, I'm not excusing them of their behavior, but I, that's why I think for us, that advocacy, that policy change is so important. Thank you. Uh, John, um, the two questions, one is the role of media and how we can shape the narratives in the, in the media. And the other is, um, it's somewhat related to what Ming asked. I see these as a fundamental issues rooted in the very nature of this society, right? So there's always what sociologists call the otherness, right? So the Asian Americans are viewed as others. So when the government is taking actions that that are not um, that are not uh, legally sound and, and ethic ethically questionable, maybe they're not thinking about us as Americans, right? Because we're others. Uh, we're not. So it's it's okay to treat foreigners badly. <laughs> so I I. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you are cautiously optimistic, but but I think this problem is is deeply rooted. Uh, it's not going to go away very soon. I, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, number one is with respect to the role of media, very important, and I think the media has helped us in in some ways. Certainly, with Doctor Who's case, the organizing that was done uh, by by the local groups there you know, certainly help to have the media think about this issue in a different way, you know, to have Dr. Who's personal story be told really shaped it in a different way. And I think that is absolutely important, right? The human impact of that. Uh, and so that that's one important piece. You're absolutely right on the otherness, right? Because, you know, when was the last time that we saw in the media, you know, a case involving someone from Israel being charged, being charged with economic espionage or someone from Russia being charged with economic espionage. Because we know, right, I don't think I'm giving any way some secrets, you know, in terms of those top 12 to 15 countries that spy on the United States, 
you know, England actually is right up there. South Korea is up there. You know, uh, Israel is up there. Russia is up. There. So, but the problem is, right, the narrative right now is focused in on China because that's where the, 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 uh, the, the geopolitical tensions lie. And so that's also what we need to break through, right? Yeah, I've actually been talking sometimes I think, well, look, if even if DOJ publishes or, or publicizes prosecutions of European economic espionage cases, then that creates a different level of trust for us because then we know they're not just looking at us, right? Then it's also reducing the level of otherness in society writ large because then the average person that's reading the paper isn't always thinking, oh, it's always the Chinese people that are being accused of spying. Oh, it's then it's more like spying is an issue that comes from a lot of different places, right? So I, I think you're absolutely right about that otherness piece. And there's so many different dimensions to how we unpack it. Uh, but you're right. I mean, look, I started out this discussion by talking about World War II and Japanese American internment about post 9-11, you know, we can even go back to the Chinese Exclusion Act and the so-called yellow peril. So unfortunately, that has always been part of American history. Um, and that's very hard to, to overcome. Uh, and I don't, <laughs> I hate to end on a negative note, recognizing we're running out of time, but I don't have a good, perfectly good answer for that. The only answer I do have for that is that's why education is important, right? is educating people about sort of where all of our communities have helped each other, right? The fact that uh, it was the Chinese railroad workers that did that dangerous work, dynamiting through the Rocky Mountains to get to the Golden Spike. It was, you know, the 442nd Combat Regiment, Japanese American soldiers that did some of the hardest fighting that was the most decorated combat regiment for the United States Army in all of World War II. Talk about those contributions so that people start seeing Asian Americans or other place, uh, people from other places as being American, but of these different descents. Yeah, I think both Representative Chu and you talked about lack of knowledge, lack of information about the contributions made by Asian Americans, both historically and today. I think one of the things that at the AASF that we want to do is to provide documentation, collect data on, on the scientific and technological and entrepreneurial contributions by, by Asian Americans to make that knowledge more available uh, to, the, to the society. Right? So that, that's, that's something that we, we can do uh, regardless of what the DOJ policy is. Uh, maybe the last question, can you share with us some insights about the five dismissed cases by the DOJ and what is your reading, what is your interpretation of this that development? I think it's a little bit premature for me to be able to, I, I don't have much more insight into it uh, than any of you right now. I mean, I, I'm just reading the media like you guys are reading the media. Um, I'm hoping to get a little bit more information in the next few days uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. One thing I do want to say, I completely agree with you in terms of talking about the contributions of Asian Americans and Chinese Americans. One thing to be careful of there, if I can ask all of you, is uh, although we do want to focus on some of the scientific contributions, I don't want us to fall into the model minority trap either. I don't want us to have people think of only Asian Americans in these technical fields, in these medical fields, only as being of a so certain social economic class. Because obviously, again, like if you think about the Chinese railroad workers, they were sort of at the lowest rung of the social economic spectrum. You think about some of our, you know, our community that works at grocery stores, that work at farms. I, I want to make sure that people understand that contribution as well, because otherwise sometimes, you know, again, sort of by putting us as that model minority, it creates a different set of tensions as well. Let, let me... Uh... Uh, add by saying that we Chinese community also needs to be uh, to, to be thinking about our own responsibilities and our own conduct. And sometimes we often just talk about ourselves. We don't communicate with others. We need to think about those 
responsibilities and the functions and the roles that we play in this society. So let me end by really thanking John and, and obviously Representative Chu, who, who agreed to speak to us because of John's invitation. And, and so we, we are uh, extremely honored to work with you, with your organization. We benefit immensely from your insights, from your knowledge, obviously about your legal expertise. And you are so open-minded and so open to opinions and, and you are so direct with us and, and we really appreciate that. And we, our community cannot thank you enough for the kind of contributions and the dedications that you have uh, provided. It's, you are the role model for all of us. So on behalf of uh, members of various organizations uh, today, uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to our uh, to future collaborations and interactions. Thank you. Good, Good night. Job. Thank you very much. Thank you for everybody for coming, by the way. Thank you very much. <laughs>